Dr. Zhou, so nice to meet you. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Uh, you, can, you can call me James. Okay, James. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about your work that you do with machine learning. I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, so I joined Stanford uh, last September, um, and half of my group works on machine learning, a lot of it developing these new class of algorithms called deep learning techniques. And the other half basically applies these algorithms, these deep learning algorithms and models to genomics and epigenomic data with the goal of really trying to better understand human diseases. Wow, can you give us an example of a, something, a disease or problem you're working on? Yeah, so, um, so we've been developing these algorithms to understand what are essentially the constraints in the human genome. Mm -hmm. So the way to think of it is that you know, the human genome has these 20,000 genes and oftentimes you have mutations that mm -hmm. essentially breaks these genes. Right? Sure. And if it breaks a gene, then the gene becomes non-functional and the person might develop some disease. Right. Other times, for different individuals, if you break a different gene, then nothing really happens, mm -hmm. that, or nothing terrible happens to that individual. Right. Right. So it's a really important question, both from basic genetics perspective, also for medical reasons, of mm -hmm. trying to identify and predict which genes are really important and which mutations are really important. So one of the applications we've been looking at is to develop basically predictive models that looks at uh, and takes in as input the sequences of genomes of large number of populations of tens of thousands of individuals and use that data to sort of predict you know, what are the mutations, what are the effects of mutations, and which mutations would like to be, to be really harmful for a given individual. So instead of having to actually damage someone's genome or DNA, you could simulate what would it be like if I broke or gain a function, loss a function in That's different right. mutations? That's right, because we don't want to go in and uh, actually perturb the person's genome. Right. So we want to try to make as many of those predictions using computational techniques, using machine learning techniques as possible. What do you think the most surprising thing you found through your work is? On the machine learning side, right, so we have been quite surprised with some of the really recent breakthroughs and developments with the deep learning technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just in the biomedical settings, you've probably heard a lot about this in, you know, in other applications. So everybody from Google and Facebook, all the tech companies around here, they're all uh, enamored with these. It's the golden these, goose here. It's, all, they're, <laughs> you know, it's this thing that everyone's talking about. Right. right? Um, and so I teach actually a class here at Stanford on deep learning for genomics. So it's a computer science class where we specifically look at how do we think about and extend these technologies that has been so revolutionary in computer vision, in natural language processing. How do we ex apply those to really important biomedical problems? Right, for you know, take images and how do we, medical images, how do we make predictions based on that or take genome sequences and predict what are the outcomes for mutations in those genome sequences. So, so we've been both very impressed and very surprised by the developments of these tools. And I think there's a, still a lot that we don't understand. You know, fundamentally, course, yeah. we don't really know when or why these algorithms really work, mm -hmm. uh, but they have been very impressive. So people are really excited about that. One of the things you didn't mention is epigenetics. So genes yeah. can break in many different ways, but also other things can act on genes. Absolutely. Does your software or your technology allow for modeling of epigenetics too, or just uh, basically mutations? That's a really great question. So actually a lot of things we have been doing recently is also been on specifically on understanding epigenetic drivers of human disease in concert with all the genetic variations. Because right. DNA doesn't just exist in a vacuum, it exists in the human body, That's right? right. So. Yeah, the packaging of the DNA. Right. Uh, it can be just as important as the be, sequence. Can be extremely important. So one of the tools that we developed is a tool called eWasher, which stands for Epigenome-Wide Association Studies. Uh, it's uh, you know, basically a tool that we developed to facilitate the analysis of these epigenomes across large number of individuals and to identify what are the changes in the epigenome, for example, in the DNA methylation, mm -hmm. other epigenetic signals that are really associated with, with human disease. And methylation is adding certain groups to DNA that changes the way DNA acts, right? Uh, that's right, right. Mm -hmm. And that, that could change how likely a gene is to be active or inactive uh, in, the, you know, in this epigenetic mechanism. So basically, you're not only studying the genes, you're studying how the genes actually work in the human body in a real life scenario, essentially. That's right. And I think that's going to be a really important part going forward as we think more about you know, precision medicine and um, really trying to get, have better diagnostics and also better treatments of human disease. It's really thinking about how to integrate all these different sources of information, genetic, epigenetic, 
And going forward, a lot of the interesting data from imaging, from wearable devices, and from the medical records. Previously, most, uh, most genetic studies, as you said, it's not really ethical to damage hu human DNA That's in right. vivo or in, or in real life people on purpose. Yeah. Most studies have used animal models. Do you think that your technology could eventually replace or just take away the need for animal models? I think the animal models are still very much complementary. I mean, there are, there are still a lot of perturbations mm -hmm. and experiments, very direct experiments that we can do on animals, on mouse models, for example, that is still very hard to do computationally or on the human data. Right? Um, and it's, I think the key, especially the key difference going to come in when we really want to test causal relations. Causal means if you do something to A, that really changes B. Sure. Right. Um, a lot of the computational models, if you just look at the data on existing individuals, you can build as good computational models as you can, but it's still fundamentally hard to get at mm -hmm. the causality question right. until you actually do experiments. And this is where I think a lot of our colleagues you know, at Stanford and other places who are developing also very, uh, you know, very interesting model systems where they can actually do these experiments. So everyone can work together. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's definitely the goal. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me.